Hey guys, today we're going to do something a little bit different. While doing some research in the US National Archives' online catalogue for another video, I came across some amazing film of the M1918 three-ton Ford tank. So I thought today we'd take a look at what is essentially America's first tank. When the US entered the war in April 1917, the US Army had no experience with tanks whatsoever. American observers in France had reported on early Allied tank use, and American enthusiasm for the new machines was lacking in many of the Army's upper echelons. This began to change, however, after the arrival of General Pershing and his staff in France, ahead of the main American Expeditionary Force. Pershing directed that a tank corps be raised, and detailed a number of officers, including the enterprising young officer, Captain George S. Patton, to establish a training ground and to report on how best to use tanks. Patton was instrumental in shaping the US Army's early tank doctrine. He wrote a highly detailed report on how to best deploy tanks to maximum effect. Patton, a cavalry officer by training, admired the French Renault FT's speed, mobility and manoeuvrability, but felt that the two doctrines of the French light and British heavy tanks could be combined. In December 1917, Colonel Samuel Rockenbach was placed in command of the new, but still tankless, US Tank Corps. Britain and France shared their tank designs with the US, but in early 1918, the American automobile giant Ford began to work on a light tank. The result was a lighter mobile tank, weighing in at 3 US tonnes, or 2.7 metric tonnes. Ford hoped to produce the new tank using as many off-the-shelf components from their automobile and truck production as they could. So the new tank was powered by two four-cylinder Ford Model T engines, in theory developing around 40 horsepower, with a maximum speed of 8 miles per hour. Taking cues from the French FT, the Model 1918's engines, fuel tank and transmission were all mounted in a compartment at the rear of the tank. These photos show the prototype during assembly in one of Ford's Detroit workshops. We're really lucky to have these photographs showing the developmental process. In the background of some of them, you can even see the engineers' hats and coats. The photos date to April 1918, suggesting that by late spring, the first prototype was assembled. Like the French FT, the Ford had a two-man crew, but it was significantly lighter, weighing four tons less. The Ford could reach speeds of up to eight miles an hour, while the slower FT could achieve around five miles an hour. The Model 1918 was 14 feet, or 4.3 meters long, making it slightly shorter than the FT. The Ford's armour was also much thinner than its French counterpart. While this helped with weight, it would have left the crew somewhat vulnerable. It had just 7 to 13 millimetres of armour, compared to the FT's 8 to 22. The tank's tracks were also extremely narrow, and while the tank was light, this could have conceivably led to issues with it getting bogged down in thick mud. In this footage we can see the earlier prototype Ford, without a gun mounted. We get a good idea of its size and just how quick it was. Roughly on par with Britain's medium whippet tank, Ford tried to replicate the ground they thought the tank would be faced with, digging holes and ditches to replicate no man's land. In this shot we get a glimpse of a Ford Model T in the background, and it doesn't appear to be much smaller than the actual tank itself. We can see the tank testing its power by ramming a wooden post, and later it has a little bit of trouble scaling a steep mound of earth. It also takes a couple of passes to destroy a fence. We also get an idea of just how difficult the tank was to steer. Like the FT, it was probably controlled by a pair of clutch levers, which controlled the tracks on either side of the tank. From this angle we can really see just how narrow the Ford's tracks were. From this footage we get a real feel for just how quick and manoeuvrable the Ford was.
As the tank comes to a stop, they open up the cab. Notice that this prototype has two forward doors. The one on the right will be replaced by the gun mount. Finally, it drives over some sleepers to test its suspension. Interestingly, these tracks appear to be much wider than the tracks we saw earlier. They also have a slightly different profile. Why Ford appears to have gone with the narrower tracks in production is unclear. This section of the footage shows the gunless prototype becoming spectacularly trapped, nose up, at an almost 90 degree angle, after trying to cross a relatively narrow trench. To prevent this, we'll see that the later versions of the tank were fitted with a trench tail. We can see that the tank can't free itself and it had to be dug out. Almost immediately after escaping the first trench, the tank nearly found us again in another ditch. In terms of armament, the Ford was limited to a single 30 caliber machine gun mounted on the right side of the hull in an armoured casement. The gun had a limited forward firing arc compared to the FT's turret mounted gun, which could rotate a full 360 degrees. It's unclear exactly what sort of gun was going to be mounted in the Ford, although a Hotchkiss M1909 Benet Merci may have been an option. But another more likely option would have been the specially developed Browning M1919 air-cooled tank machine gun, which had been specially developed for use in tanks. Of course, a later incarnation of the M1919 would become iconic during World War II. But judging from the size of the armoured housing for the gun, it may have been intended to mount the M1918 Marlin tank machine gun, which had large aluminium cooling fins. The Ford had a two-man crew, with a driver on the left and a gunner on the right. The tank had a large front hatch positioned in front of the driver's position, which allowed the crew to get in and out. The driver also had a cupola with vision slits on the roof of the tank which allowed him to drive when the hatch was closed. This must have been difficult to see out of unless the driver changed his driving position. The tank has an exposed front axle connecting its large front track idlers, which would also have been susceptible to damage from enemy fire and from hitting obstacles. At the rear are the drive sprockets which transferred the power from the engine into the tracks. Placing the drive sprockets at the rear simplified the design of the tank. Along the body of the tank are two sets of three suspension wheels, with two track support rollers above them. This is a change from the single support roller seen in the earlier prototype. Now we get a glimpse inside the tank, we can see the driver operating the controls. How exactly the tank's gun was aimed isn't clear. There doesn't appear to be a vision slot for the gunner. If we look closely we can see that the gunner's hatch still appears to be hinged, suggesting that like the driver's hatch, it can be opened as well. In this piece of footage we can see as many as half a dozen pre-production tanks on the move during a demonstration at Ford's plant in Detroit. It's worth noting that these later tanks have the trench tail attached at the rear. We can see just how fast the tanks were. Two collide and there's a couple of near misses as the Fords navigate the test area. They also still have some difficulty navigating the steeper terrain, and one becomes stuck requiring two other tanks to pull it clear of the bank.
First, one tank tries, but doesn't have enough power. So another one joins the effort. And finally frees the beached tank. The War Department was eager to get tanks into production, ordering 15,000 Model 1918s from Ford, with 500 to be delivered in January 1919, with production continuing at 100 per day after that. An initial batch of 15 were ordered for testing, and at least one of these was sent to France, where it was evaluated. The French were unimpressed, finding it inferior to their FT but they did consider it as an artillery tractor for the French 75. The US also considered the Ford for this role, and the caption of this photograph from 1919 describes it as a three-ton tractor for pulling the new American 75mm split trail gun. The war ended before large-scale production of the Model 1918 could begin. With just 15 of the Ford light tanks built, we're lucky to have this much film of them in action. Today, only two of the Ford light tanks survive in US Army collections. In reality, the Model 1918 was more a machine gun carrier than a tank. How effective the Model 1918 would have been on the Western Front is a matter for speculation. It's difficult to say. While the French may not have felt it was an improvement over the FT, it was cheap, and it certainly showed enough merit for the War Department to make a large order. But its narrow tracks, thin armour and minimal armament may have proven to be a problem in the field. The Ford Model 1918's real legacy is that while the US had built other tanks during the war, including the Model 1917, a copy of the FT, and the Mark 8 heavy tank in collaboration with Britain, the Model 1918 was the first truly American designed and built tank. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed something a little bit different. I'm no Chieftain or David Fletcher, but I find early tank development really interesting and the Model 1918 is an especially fascinating tank because it was the first one designed and built by the US. I couldn't have made this video without the US National Archives wonderful online catalogue, which I highly recommend checking out. Also worth checking out is my accompanying blog on the Model 1918 over on our website www.armorersbench.com Please like, share and subscribe. Sharing the video with friends really helps the channel to grow. If you'd like to support us, please consider checking out our Patreon. Tab is an entirely viewer-supported project and your help is very, very much appreciated. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Tanks are so cool.